As ABA professionals, we should know what the four functions of behavior are and how to identify them. On this podcast episode, we're talking about the four functions of behavior, giving real life examples and giving you tips on what you can do when you encounter each one. So the functions of behavior are super important, but not always very intuitive. And it's so important to know what the function is because we might be accidentally reinforcing a behavior by really trying to mean well. Um, We have a student who comes every day to school and it has a very hard time transitioning into school. So has a meltdown when he gets dropped off and mom trying to help says, oh no, I'm just going to take him home. It's okay. Like, let's just go home. And so what happens the next day when mom drops him off is he has a meltdown and he gets to go home. So mom means well, she's trying to help. She doesn't want to leave an an upset child in school. But when we're looking at the function of the behavior, it really is escape to mom, right? And so what she's really doing is reinforcing the behavior so that it's going to keep happening because he keeps getting access to the function that the behavior is trying to communicate. So, you know, when we look at the four functions of behavior, we typically go with an acronym and we usually say EATS or SEAT, same thing. Um, So we look at those bullet points, but really overall, before we talk about the four functions of behavior, we really do need to recognize um, one function that we never talk about, and that's communication. Most of the time, our students are trying, all of the time, I would argue, our students are trying to communicate something with us. They're trying to tell us something. So we need to figure out what that is. So let's go through the acronyms and start one at a time. So the S for seat is sensory. Another name for that is automatic reinforcement. So it's the reason I bite my nails. It's the reason people keep smoking. It's the reason that you keep doing things because they just make you feel good. Um, And it's the same thing for our kids. There isn't a clear trigger. There isn't a clear consequence or reinforcement or anything that's really maintaining that behavior other than that automatic or sensory feel. It's just It it feels good, so they keep doing it. I'm fiddling with a pen right now. Um, That could also be sensory or automatic reinforcement. Um, The next one would be in SEAT, the acronym. The next one would be the E for escape. Um, We can also say escape or avoidance. And that really is, you know, I'm engaging this behavior because I don't want to do it or I want to avoid it or I need a break. And that could be the reason as well. So then the A for stands for attention. Um, And it's the child trying to say, I want attention for something. I want you to look at me. Usually the trigger or the antecedent is lack of attention. And that's how you would know that it's attention is because they were, you know, nobody's paying attention to them or it was downtime or they just weren't being engaged with. Mom answers or the mom phone. Or mom picks up the phone. <laughs> that's a classic <laughs> right? example. Yeah, um, I closed the bathroom door and all of a sudden everyone's screaming in my house. They right? didn't need me beforehand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and the T is tangible. So, you know, engaging in negative behavior because because somebody wants something. Um, You know, it's the classic example of the kid in the Walmart lineup and they see the candy bars right by the cash checkout and they throw a tantrum because they want a candy bar. Or it's time to clean up your preferred activity and then what happens. Um, Another good way to kind of think, generally think of these is they want something or they don't want something. So they either want attention or tangible, um, or they don't want to do something like you've presented them with a demand that they want to escape from. So those are kind of the two, you know, general categories. And that's like majorly oversimplifying, you know, what, how we look at behavior, um, but it's a good place to start from. And then we can look a little bit more deeply into why this is happening. With this podcast, we're giving out a freebie and the freebie is um, the functions of behavior cheat sheet. And it goes through all of these functions in a little bit more detail, but let's talk more about these functions and what to do when we encounter these functions. Also, it's important to say that it could be more than one function. So you could be escaping from a demand to go play with a toy. So that would be escape to tangible, or you could be escaping like the student I was describing, escaping from school to get mom's attention. Um, so there can be a combination of those things. And once we've determined the function when we're looking at a behavior, the important thing to remember is to try to do the opposite of that function. So if you're dealing with a student who really wants escape from a certain activity or demand, then you're going to, you're going to try to teach them different ways to get that escape. Um, thinking about replacement skills that will help them get escape, teach them to ask for a break, teach them to ask for help or say that they don't want to do it. So what other ways can they get escape besides for this challenging behavior? And then when the challenging behavior does come up, you're going to do your best to like not grant that escape. 
And if a student is, you know, engaging in negative behavior for escape purposes, they're trying to tell you that what they're doing is either too hard or maybe it's just boring. So really take a look at what they're escaping from and looking at how you can modify that. You know, I had a student one time who always escaped and it was honestly, it was like I could predict it. Oh, I'm grabbing this program right now. And all of a sudden the behavior would start like I could predict it. So if I can predict that, why wouldn't I just take a look at that program and say, this program itself needs to change. And what can I do about it? And we have a student now who will, you know, hit his friend because he wants to play with them. So I, when I'm thinking about that, I think, okay, well, the function is attention. And if you would look at it very black and white, you think, well, the friend shouldn't give him attention if he hit him. But I'm thinking like this poor student, you know, English is not his first language. He doesn't really know how to interact. Um, he's really just saying, play with me. I want to play with you. So instead of getting the other student to ignore him, what we're going to work on is, well, let's facilitate a really fun you know, game together so that we can model, play with me, let's do it together. I want to build a tower and giving him lots and lots of teaching chart trials to expose him to better language to say, play with me, um, as opposed to just thinking about like, well, let's just have them ignore this child until he somehow magically remembers to say, play with me. No, it's a lot of teaching and modeling and prompting them through these replacement behaviors so that they have better ways to communicate what this function is trying to say. I had a student who engaged in aggression as well on the playground and it was for attention and the teachers, you know, were saying, oh, this kid, he's so aggressive. And I'm thinking in my head, this sweet little boy, I've never seen him aggressive before what's happening. And the poor kid, all he wanted was a friend. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at this and we said, oh my gosh, it always happens on the slide because he's trying to say, hey, this is fun. And he's getting really excited. Um, and it always seems to happen when, you know, he's approaching another peer because he just wants to play. Um, so very similar to what Shira did is outside of that environment, we were able to facilitate play with those peers and be able to model those words. But in addition to that, we gave him targeted phrases. Um, we were able to to make up some visuals that had these phrases. And we really taught him to say these phrases. Um, if you've got somebody who's not speaking, you can get them to exchange a picture with a peer or maybe tap them on the shoulder gently. Um, some other replacement behavior so that they're not you know, hitting and, and trying to get uh, attention inappropriately. Yeah, one of the main reasons we want to figure out the function is because we want to know what can we teach them, what skill is missing that we could teach them instead. And I really encourage, instead of just focusing on the one, a function means consequence. So if they're wanting attention, I ignore. If they're wanting escape, I follow through to really think outside the box and think about, well, let's look a little bit deeper. So according to the functional assessment, yeah, it may look like escape, but what is the student really trying to say and how can I help them say it? So instead of just, well, he's trying to escape from demand. So I'm just going to like, you know, physically prompt him through this worksheet until he does it. No, we're going to try to figure out, well, is he trying to say, this is hard for me? I don't like it. I need a break. Um, what form of escape would help him through this? And how can we teach him that skill so that we don't just have to focus on the follow through? So that's really why we're looking at the function. And we would just really encourage you to kind of think outside the box of those black and white like function based intervention um, so that the function is giving you information about how to treat this student. You bet. Um, you know, if you've got, you know, the function of attention, for instance, you know, we talked about, you know, teaching people some initiation statements, but what if it's also about giving some non-contingent attention throughout the day? So we talk about the classic example of as soon as the phone rings or as soon as mom gets a text, you know, the child's right on mom. Um, but what about having some quote unquote me time or mommy me time when, um, you know, at other parts throughout the day, and this is where we can teach the parent to put down their phones and really engage for a specific amount of time with their student or with their student, with their child, um, and really, you know, give them that non-contingent attention, build it into a schedule, maybe make a visual schedule so that the student can see when that me time is so that when mom's phone does ring or mom has to go to the bathroom, heaven forbid, um, you know, they can show the, their child on schedule, look, you know, mommy's busy here and here, but look right down here, this is when we're going to have our me time together. Yeah, it's about knowing what, you know, fills their bucket. And then the more that you can know that, the more you can also know what motivates them. So then you can start using these as reinforcers. So if you know that they're engaging in things for attention, instead of just ignoring them, then 
you know, let's make that the reinforcement. If you can get through this task or if you can say it nicely or whatever the expectation is, then we're going to play the silliest game and you're going to have all my attention instead of just being something, well, if you do it, then you can get something tangible. Um, tangible is not their motivator, it's attention. So it also gives you a lot of insight into what you can use as reinforcement and motivation to get them to do the things that you want them to do. And let's talk about sensory or that automatic reinforcement for a few minutes. Um, I have to say as a behavior analyst, this is the area that, um, you know, is a little bit softer and a little bit um, less analytical. And, you know, we always, Shira just took a deep breath beside me. We always kind of go, do it. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what to do when it's automatic reinforcement or, Ooh, I, I don't know about that weighted vest or, Ooh, really, I should really be, you know, engaging in a sensory diet every so often what's happening. Um, so in terms of sensory, I mean, automatic reinforcement is a real thing. Um, and here I go playing with this pen again, I'm going to put it down and I'm going to stop. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, we see students engaging and sensory or automatic reinforcement when A, they're either overwhelmed or B, when they have nothing to do. So if it's when they have nothing to do, we need to look at their environment and see how we can enrich their environment. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I, I need my downtime. I just can't wait to like flop on the couch and do nothing. Um, well, a lot of our learners hate that they hate the downtime, they fear recess time. Um, you know, they really do need structure all the time. So, how do we give these learners who are seeking structure that structure? Um, other times it's about increasing leisure skills. You know, how do we increase those leisure skills? What kind of leisure skills can we teach them besides looking at a tablet? Um, something that can engage them so that they're not engaging in destructive automatic reinforcement. But the only way to really know if it is automatic reinforcement is with data, like just collect that data and see if there's really no trend, if there's really no triggers. Sometimes we call it automatic because that, you know, jumping up and down or flapping or covering their ears is getting them out of a demand. Um, and it looks sensory, but it's also working as escape. So really collect that data, make sure that it's sensory. And then even if you're treating it as sensory, um, continue to collect the data so that you're not, you know, using it as reinforcement, you're not increasing that behavior and, and still looking at it as analytically as possible. And that's such a huge point is that data collection piece that we want to collect data throughout this whole Whole process, um, basically to see whether or not what we're doing is working. And if we're seeing behavior increase, it means we have the function wrong. So, you know, if we, you know, analyze behavior and we think that the, you know, the function is this, but yet we're seeing behavior increase, even though we're trying to treat that function, well, then we're wrong. We need to go back to the drawing board and take a look at what that function is. So in summary, today we talked about the four functions of behavior and you can use the acronym EATS or SEAT, and those stand for sensory, escape, access to tangible, and attention. Um, and really thinking about what is this behavior trying to say or trying to communicate, and how can we give our students the skills to communicate it better? You bet. So click on this link in around this video to get your free functions of behavior data sheet.